We do better when we look for a path that we'll enjoy more, even if it's a little bit more circuitous. And the reason for that is if we enjoy the way that we're pursuing our goals, we persist longer. You're watching Young and Profiting Podcast on YouTube. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and on Young and Profiting Podcast, we investigate a new topic each week and interview some of the brightest minds in the world. Before we get started, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified every time we drop a new video. Hey, Katie, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Me too. I'm excited for this conversation. So for those who don't know you, you are a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. You're a Google Scholar. You're an author of the best-selling book, How to Change. And your close colleague and fellow professor, Angela Duckworth, describes you as the smartest person she's ever met. So your name has been referenced at least five times on my podcast before. We talk a lot about human behavior. Your peers often bring you up. And before we dive into all your great work on change, I'd love to understand what first got you interested in human behavior? Oh, that's such a great question. I think, honestly, I got interested in this as a young person just because I was trying to figure out what was wrong with me. So a lot of scholars in this area are really doing not just research, but a little bit of me search. And when I realized there was a science behind optimizing my decisions and figuring out how to drag myself off the couch into the gym and to make better financial choices and so on, then I got really excited because I'm an engineer by training and a data person at heart. And finding this opportunity to sort of marry all the things I love, like understanding how to make life better with science was this really exciting revelation. Yeah. And so from my research, I saw that you studied financial engineering in college. And so what is the relationship between engineering and human behavior? Yeah, great question. And it's not an obvious one at first blush, right? Because I spent a lot of time taking classes about computer science and statistics and optimization. Uh, None of these things obviously relate to human behavior. But actually, it's really interesting because The origins of my field, I'm a behavioral scientist and in a field that includes behavioral economists, go back to the 1950s when someone named Herb Simon was realizing that advances in computing technology gave us a lot of insight into the human mind. And that if we started to think about human decision making, the way we think about computer decision making, we could actually make giant leaps forward. We could recognize that just like computers, humans are limited and their capacity to remember things, and their capacity to compute things, and that we have to work within those constraints. And so actually, I think there are a lot of analogies. And in my work, the way I sort of use engineering as a jumping off point is by recognizing that every situation where we want to make a better decision is a problem to be solved. And we need to unpack that problem by thinking about what are the forces opposing our goals, and how can we overcome them strategically, just like an engineer would try to figure out what are the forces opposing, you know, keeping the structure erect and how can we overcome them? That's super, super interesting. And so I want to get into change. I want to get into the meat and potatoes of the interview. And so I learned from your book that an estimated 40% of premature deaths are the result of personal behaviors that we can change. So we do a lot of things that we know are bad for us, like not exercising or eating poorly or doing recreational drugs. We, We all know those things are bad. So what is it that makes it so hard for us to change? Oh, gosh, so many things. And first of all, I just thank you for bringing up that statistic because it really blew my mind and is part of what gave me laser focus in my career was recognizing the opportunity to change lives for the better once we better understood what what keeps us from changing. But change is so hard for a lot of reasons. A lot of the reasons I actually don't cover in my research, reasons like financial barriers to change, right? Health barriers to change. So there's a lot of reasons that people can't achieve their goals that are external to them. But what I study is the internal barriers to change. So I take a look at what inside us is actually making change hard, even when we've got everything else lined up, which goodness knows is hard hard to make happen. So it turns out some of the big barriers are things like our tendency to care more about instant gratification than long-term rewards, our tendency to procrastinate, which directly follows from that overweighting of instant gratification, um, our forgetfulness, our preference to take the path of least resistance or be a little bit lazy in a slightly less nice way of putting it, our lack of confidence in certain situations. So there are all these different barriers to change that are internal. And I think what's really important 
for people to recognize, and they don't always, is that science has a lot of solutions, but they're not one size fits all. So once you actually understand better which of these challenges you're facing, you can use better techniques that are better matched to that challenge and and see better results. Yeah, I like that you focus on that in your book. You say you need to actually know what your obstacles are and then design something that's going to work for you because it's not one size fits all. You can't just have some life hack that's going to fix everything for you overnight. Right, absolutely. Well, first of all, there there are no easy solutions in this in this sphere. Unfortunately, there's sort of there's no like pill you can take or shot you can <laughs> give yourself that will magically allow you to change and achieve your goals. But we do have lots of good science. And even if it's not a quick fix, it's a more likely to work fix if you apply it um, in the right situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to touch on something that you briefly mentioned. You talked about impulsivity or present bias. And that's when we act impulsively. Uh, We prioritize instant gratification over our long term goals. So why is it that we're like naturally tendent to be impulsive? Why is that? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. And I should say, you know, this is one of those things that you really an evolutionary psychologist is best uh, (laughs) trained to answer. So my understanding is that our best, you know, it's a guess. We don't know, right? Because we can't go back and observe our ancestors and figure out when did this trait evolve exactly. But our best guess is that this was a really good trait at some point in our ancient history. Because at at some point, you want to just prioritize like that food that you can get in the moment you can get it and the mate that you can have and the second you can have them. <laughs> All of these things that <laughs> would make sense to our long-term survival as a species um, a long time ago when we were evol- evolving, but that aren't so great when you're trying to choose between Cheetos and a salad or um, you know going to the gym versus sitting on the couch and binge watching Netflix. So the instincts that we evolved in a totally different moment don't seem that well adapted to our present um, circumstances. Yeah, it's it's so interesting when you say that because it's so true. It's like when we were, you know, hunters and gatherers, it totally made sense to like want to have that fruit right when you see it, right? Uh, now it's, it's causing a problem for us. So let's talk about the two main ways in your book that you talk about counteracting this impulsiveness and that's temptation bundling and gamification. So temptation bundling, from my understanding, is pairing something that you like with something that you don't like. I thought this was so, so good. So tell us about that and maybe share some examples. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, just to back up for one second, I want to point out some of my favorite research that that suggests why these two strategies you noted are so valuable, um, which is work by University of Chicago psychologist Ayelet Fishbach, which shows that most of us have the wrong intuition when we're thinking about how to reach our goals. And we think we should just take a really efficient path and that all that's the best, right? Like who, who could argue with efficiency? And I'm an engineer here, right? Um, but instead, what she's found is that we do better when we look for a path that we'll enjoy more, even if it's a little bit more circuitous. And the reason for that is if we enjoy the way that we're pursuing our goals, we persist longer. Whereas if it's painful, because of present bias, we throw in the towel. You know, if you're going to the gym and getting on the maximally punishing Stairmaster, it's not a fun experience. Whereas if you're going and doing a Zumba class with a friend, you love it and you keep going back. And maybe you get less in shape per unit visit, but (laughs) overall you have a better outcome because you're repeatedly showing up. So I think that's a really important insight, and it points to these uh, different ways then that we can actually make it fun to pursue our goals and to overcome procrastination, to overcome impulsivity. We want to make it so that we're not like, you know, having to resist doing what sounds awful, but rather it actually sounds good to us. So temptation bundling is exactly what you said. You pair a chore with something that is a source of pleasure or a temptation. And I did this first in my own life, actually, with exercise. So I only let myself enjoy indulgent entertainment while I was exercising at the gym. And that meant I started craving trips to the gym and wasting less time at home on garbage when I should have been getting my work done as a graduate student. And it was so revolutionary in my life in terms of the benefits that I started studying it, um, ran experiments demonstrating this is useful for other people too, and thinking about ways to apply it more broadly. So in my own life, I don't just temptation bundle with exercise, but have found all sorts of other ways to create these bundles, like saving favorite podcasts for while I'm doing household chores, favorite bottle of wine I only open when I'm making a fresh meal for my family, um, restaurants that have unhealthy options that I limit visits to only when I'm spending time with either a difficult relative or someone I should be seeing more of at work who's an important 
mentee perhaps, but can be otherwise not as enticing to spend time with if I didn't link it with that unhealthy meal. Um, So there are all these different ways that in life we can create temptation bundles and make something that would otherwise be dreaded and procrastinated on alluring and instantly gratifying. So you basically flip the script. Yeah. And I I loved your example. I I listened to you on another podcast and you were talking about this restaurant example, how if you have to meet somebody that you don't particularly want to meet with, you go to like a burger joint. (laughs) It's your favorite. (laughs) It's your favorite spot and it helps make it a little bit better. So I think that's it's such a great tactic, you know, and I feel like we do this naturally. And if you think about like cherry flavored cough syrup, right, like that's another great example. You don't want to take that nasty medicine, but if it tastes okay, you might you might end up taking it. So I think that's a great lesson. Like just in general, trying to make things more fun um, is, is, a, is a great strategy. So speaking of that, how about gamification? Is there a right or wrong way to do that? Yeah, gamification is really interesting and is actually a little bit tricky. So the research on gamification's benefits is mixed. And the reason for that seems to be that if you are intrinsically motivated and the gamification is aligned with what you are trying to achieve yourself, the benefits are pretty consistently um, achieved. But when it's being imposed on you and you know your employer is trying to gamify some miserable task, it can feel like forced fun and it can actually backfire. So gamification is a promising strategy when it truly works, but the recipe is a little tricky to actually turn something that would otherwise feel like a chore into a source of joy uh, just by adding, you know, points and bells and whistles and streaks and stars. That doesn't always do it for people. Um, It can be really motivating, though, if you have some goal of your own, say you're trying to get in shape or you're trying to learn a new language or you're trying to meditate more regularly, you choose a program, you engage with it, and you say, you know, help me achieve this, and then it gamifies the experience. Experience, that seems to be more universally beneficial because it it never is going to take on this feeling of forced fun and it's helping you experience your successes in a way that's a little lighter hearted and and also the tracking itself that comes with gamification is useful. Yeah, it, I, I find that very fascinating because gamification was like a really cool, unique concept like 10 years ago, but then it seemed like everybody started to gamify everything. And then it kind of just got like corny, right? And I remember working at like Hewlett Packard and Disney before I was an entrepreneur and they would always try to like gamify everything. And it was it was just like corny or just like, I know what you're up to, right? Uh, right very hear, transparent. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear like a good example of gamification versus like a bad one. Yeah. Well, okay. Here's one of my favorites. This is a research study that was done actually with Wikipedia to try to gamify the experience that their contributors have um, when they're posting content and updates on the Wikipedia website. So for, for listeners and watchers who aren't super familiar, right, Wikipedia is like this amazing encyclopedia that's created by an all-volunteer army around the world and tells us everything we need to know about everything, including probably both of us and this podcast. <laughs> um, so A lot of volunteers who start doing great work for Wikipedia don't stick around or don't stay engaged. They're sort of momentarily interested. They sign up for an account. They do a little bit of editing, and then they burn out. And so the company was looking for ways to make the experience more enticing and engaging. Again, this is something people are opting into. It's volunteer work. How can we make it a little more fun? And they partnered with this researcher named Yana Gallus, who's at UCLA now, and she had the idea to do a really simple gamification, thing, like the most minimal, which was just give people a little award for um, their great work when they were new employees or new volunteers um, in their first month. And she A-B tested this. So people who had been top performers, some of them were randomly assigned to get this award, telling them, hey, you're a superstar. We're so pleased with the work you've done. And others didn't get that notification, that praise, and it's like a little badge that shows up for them. And she compared what happens. And she sees a huge increase in the rate at which the people who get this little badge, this little bit of praise and award and and small bit of gamification, stay engaged with the platform, not just for the next month, but actually for a whole year. And I think it's a really nice illustration that sort of showing our appreciation with things like badges or or other awards um, in a setting where somebody is intrinsically motivated, but might 
lose that motivation can just make them feel appreciated. And like the whole thing is more fun and rewarding. So I love that simple example. There are many others, but that that's just shows you a simple setting where gamification in, in this, a very minimalist way can be useful. You also asked for an example of where it could go awry. And for this, I'll point to research by my colleagues at Wharton, Nancy Rothbard and Ethan Mollick, who ran a big experiment with a sales uh, force type company. It was, you know, Everyone working on different sales floors is is trying to get as many sales as they can. And the company randomly rolled out a basketball gamification program where um, every time you get a sale, it's, you know, called a dunk or a free throw. There's like different different names given in in basketball terminology for different sizes of scores. Um, You can win a bottle of champagne at the end of the program. There's all this sort of gimmicky stuff around it emails, leaderboards, and they rolled it out and actually didn't see benefits from this. And when they dug into the data more carefully, what they found is that a lot of people said this felt like forced fun. It wasn't fun for me. I wasn't into it at all. I just hated it. And it didn't actually have benefits. In fact, seemed to backfire among those. There was a small fraction of people who said, I love basketball. I love this. And it seemed to help them maybe a little bit. But the the lack of appreciating the audience and the mismatch and that, that sense that they were creating forced fun to achieve an, an outcome that the company cared about and not that the individual necessarily was really trying personally to achieve seemed to be uh, the missing ingredient. Yeah. So I think the key is, first of all, the person should volunteer, you know, on their own accord, right? And they should also want to do that thing. They like proactively want to do that thing and have incentive to do that. And ideally what you're creating actually does feel pleasant, joyful, exciting in some way, right? And even something as small as the little badge I mentioned, Wikipedia really was a source of joy for people to feel appreciated in a way that they didn't realize someone was looking and noticing what they'd, what they'd accomplished. So think about, is it really creating fun? And can you build this in a way that will resonate with people. Yeah. And it seems like gamification with the rewards and everything, it makes total sense because when we talk about habits, it's always cue, routine, reward, right? You end with a reward, you get a shot of dopamine in your brain, you want to keep doing it and you crave that dopamine. So that's why it works. So that's pretty interesting. So there's some other things we can do to limit our temptations and you call them commitment devices. So how can we use commitment devices to create better change? Commitment devices are so interesting, Um, I think because they're so powerful and frankly underused. And they're basically, it's very counterintuitive. I think this is one of the reasons people don't use them. It's setting up constraints on yourself. So we're used to our employer penalizing us when we, you know, don't do something well, like, oh, you get a ding on your bonus, or having constraints set up by our government. Say you drive too fast, which we might be tempted to do, you're going to get hit with a ticket, or you're going to get thrown in jail if you break this rule. Okay, so we're used to all those constraints being imposed on our bad behavior by someone else. And what a commitment device is, is it's actually you saying, here are some behaviors I don't want to engage in. Here are some things I want to prevent myself from doing, and I'm going to ding myself if I mess up. So let me give you a really concrete example. Um, Say you're smoking and you want to quit. You can put money on the line that you say, you know, I'm going to put $500 down and I'm going to I'm going to forfeit that money in three months if I haven't quit smoking. And I'm going to find a friend who's going to hold me accountable. And there are actually websites that you can use where they'll they'll let you do this, where you put money on the line, you choose a referee to hold you accountable, and you give up that money to a charity of your choice if you do not achieve your goal. The smoking example, I think, is a particularly useful one because there's a wonderful experiment testing whether or not this helps smokers quit. And in this randomized controlled trial where people were either given a standard smoking cessation, you know, protocol or that protocol plus the opportunity to put money on the line that they would forfeit if they didn't pass a urine test in six months, the people who also had that commitment device, they uh, quit at a 30 percent higher rate. So it's really powerful stuff. And Yet we don't love the idea of penalizing ourselves, of putting money on the line or saying, you know, I'm going to constrain myself, you know, I'm going to shut off my phone or prevent myself from visiting certain websites after certain hours. Any, anything that constrains you feels a little funny and yet very powerful. 
Yeah, I, it seems like when you put money down for anything, you just take it a lot more seriously. <laughs> Absolutely, you're incentivizing yourself, right? That's your that's exactly what you're doing. Now there's a consequence. And if you recognize that you want to create incentives that set you up for success with your life goals and that those goals while important to you in the long run might not align with immediate temptations. You might, you know, want to eat the extra burger when you go out for dinner with a friend or spend the extra money or go to the casino when you know you shouldn't. If you set up boundaries so that there's a fine associated with those decisions in the future, if you make them impulsively, then you're actually much less likely to fall into those traps. And is there anything aside from cash that you can use as a commitment device? Yeah, that's a great question. There are all sorts of penalties you can impose on yourself (laughs) naturally, quite naturally. You can set simple boundaries, right? Just time time-based boundaries. Like, I'm not allowed to do this outside the hours of X and Y or else um, a friend will shame me, for instance. Um, so, so you can use shame, accountability to others. Those are certainly useful things. You could take privileges away from yourself. You know, just think about the way that you would manage anyone else. If you were managing someone or if you were raising a, a kid and thinking about what are the things that are your tools, sort of carrots and sticks, you can basically do the same to yourself proactively um, recognizing what your goals are. Mm. Okay, so I want to switch gears a little bit and I want to talk about willpower. So I had a lady named Gretchen Rubin on the show and your work reminded me a lot of about like a lot of stuff that she talks about. And in my opinion, I feel like there's certain types of personality types that tend to stick to goals. So including my, my myself, I tend to just be okay with willpower, right? I keep the promises that I tell myself. And I had Gretchen Rubin on the show and she talked a bit about something called the four tendencies framework and it's four distinct personality types. And some of us are upholders, which means that we respond to our outer and inner expectations and we keep the promises to ourselves. And then some of us are obligers, meaning we don't keep the promises to ourselves, but we can keep the promises to other people. So I'd love to hear your opinion in terms of personality type and the ability to use willpower. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. So first of all, I should say that I am not a personality psychologist and literally have have no training in this area, but I do hang out with one. Um, So I've picked up a tiny bit over time. Uh, Angela Duckworth is a collaborator of mine and best known probably for her work developing the grit scale, which is arguably an important personality trait for exerting willpower. So what I, I found particularly interesting in, in talking to Angela about her work and how self-control and willpower are related to life success is that actually, um, even though you can measure to some degree how gritty someone is or how much self-control they have, um, it tends to vary tremendously from context to context within person. So you might be very good at exerting self-control in your personal life, but terrible in your professional life or vice versa, right? So some people, it's like, I, I can always get to the gym on time, but I'm not so good at staying organized with my meetings, <laughs> right? Or I, I can really manage my diet, but um, not my love life, right? So we all have- That's so true, yeah. Yeah, so interestingly, like the differences in how well we are able to exert self-control across parts of our life are about as large as the differences between people and self-control. So we're sort of made up of lots of mini-me's and it really depends on the setting. And that's part of the reason I think it's so important and so much of my research doesn't focus on personality, but rather on recognizing that we all have different barriers to change and which ones will come up are going to be different depending on the context, um, depending on the person, but also sometimes, you know, within person, when you're trying to motivate yourself to do your meditation routine, you're going to need really different tools than when you're trying to motivate yourself to stay productive at work. So uh, I think personality is fascinating, even though I don't know a lot about it. But I also think the research points to the need to recognize we're not simple. (laughs) We're really complex. And so hoping to sort of pinpoint my type and what does that mean I need in terms of achieving my goals may be a bridge too far. Yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about setting ourselves up for success from the onset of wanting to start a new behavior. You talk about this concept called fresh starts. I think the other term for it is a temporal landmark. Um, we had Dan Pink on the show and he talks about New Year's resolutions and starting your habits on, you know, or resolutions on Jan 1 or your birthday. Can you tell us about fresh starts and what we need to know about them? 
Yeah. And I love that Dan Pink talked about my work on here. That's so cool. Um, he's wonderful. I love his writing. And uh, so the Fresh Start Effect is something that my collaborators and I started looking at about a decade ago after I made a visit to uh, Google's headquarters and was presenting a bunch of research on behavior change to their HR leadership. And I got this fantastic question at the end of my presentation, which was, OK, we're completely sold on using these behavioral science tools to try to improve our employees' engagement with all these different programs. Programs we're offering from educational programming to wellness programming to financial wellness offerings. But is there some ideal timing for encouraging change? And I just thought it was such a fantastic question. So I came back to my office in Philadelphia, sat down with my then PhD student, Heng Chen Dai, um, who's now a professor at UCLA, and Jason Reese, who's also uh, a collaborator. And we just started hashing out our intuitions. And we all shared the intuition, of course, January 1, right? That's the magic moment when 40% of Americans set goals. But what we were interested in is there's something generalizable, some principle uh, around New Year's that we could sort of extract insights from that could be useful um, and tell us things about other moments that would be that would be good to start pursuing our goals. So we learned that there's this whole literature on the way we think about time and that we don't actually think about time and our lives in a straight line, but instead we think about ourselves like we're characters in a book and like we're living chapters. And so there's these discontinuities in our in our life timelines, right? You know, you think about maybe um, the college years or uh, the years living in a certain city or working for a certain employer and you sort of bookmark or bookend life around these shifts. And it turns out there are big chapters and small chapters as well. There's sort of the mini chapter breaks. And everything from the start of a new week or a new month to the celebration of holidays that give us a sense of fresh starts like Memorial Day, Labor Day, um, birthdays, turn out to, they all they all have the same psychology of creating a chapter break in life and giving us a sense that we are starting something fresh, that we're turning the page, that we have a new beginning, that we have a new self. And with that feeling comes optimism. Because you can say, you know, yeah, last year or um, last week, I, I planned to get around to X, but I didn't. But that was the old me. And this is the new me. And the new me is going to be different. So those discontinuities give us this sense that we can change. They also lead us to step back and think bigger picture about our lives and our plans, which can really facilitate goal pursuit. So we've done all this research, um, both on sort of the inner workings of why it is that these fresh starts matter, but also documenting big spikes in things like gym attendance and goal creation and searching for the term diet on Google at these moments that we associate with fresh starts in life. Yeah. So fresh starts seem to really help us make sure that we get started, right? They're great motivators to get started. But it turns out that 80% of New Year's resolutions fail, right? And so we obviously need strategies to make sure that we keep executing on our goals. So one thing that I found super interesting with your work was this concept of, you know, flexibility and emergency reserves and, and kind of setting ourselves up to be more flexible as opposed to rigid in order to execute on our goals. So can you talk about why rigidity doesn't work? Yeah, rigidity, um, I will say, is something that I was initially bullish on, which probably sounds silly now that I'm putting the term rigidity to it. But when I first started thinking about habits and what we knew about habits, it seemed clear that you wanted a lot of consistency in order to build lasting habits. And um, so I have done research looking at whether or not it's actually better when you're building a habit to try to always do it at the same time or try to vary when you are engaging in the behavior. And I was sure that consistency would be better and surprised, actually, to find that it was worse. And when I sort of dug into the data I had analyzed and that I'd collected to look at this, where we'd you know, randomly assign people to basically either engage in the behavior they were hoping to make habitual on a really consistent basis or in a more variable way, what we found is that the people who were consistent, built rigid habits. So after the startup period, when we're sort of training them to to build the habit, they're decent at getting to whatever the, you know, getting to their goal in this narrow time frame that they had, had picked as their like magic time. But if they miss that window, they don't do it at all. Whereas people who had trained their habit in a more variable way, who are like, you know, say trying to go to the gym um, more consistently, and sometimes they go at 9 a.m., sometimes they go at noon, sometimes they go at 5, they also tend to go, they tend to 
choose a time that's optimal. And let's say half of their visits end up being at that time. And that's useful. You do want sort of a first best. But if they miss their best window, they still get around to doing it. And overall, that leads to more robust and lasting habits and and better um, outcomes. So what this this led to this concept that like rigidity is something that we we often characterize as consistency and we think of as good for building habits. But if it gets too consistent and too rigid, it becomes brittle and we actually won't achieve as much. And, and there is some real meaningful value if you're trying to build a new habit, whether it's around, you know, learning a language and when will you practice or going to the gym or check-ins with, you know, mentees who you want to spend time with, whatever that thing is, meditation. It's important not always to do it at the same time, but to build in some variability. So because life life doesn't always allow you to get to your goals at the same time. Things come up and you want to be able to pivot and have a fallback plan. And that really is what builds the most lasting change. Yeah, I think the key is like always having a backup plan, right? I think that's definitely key. So related to this is something you call the what the hell effect. And and basically from my understanding, it's like, let's say you're on, on a diet and you know you cave, you grab the chips instead of the apple. Then the rest of the day, you're going to pig out because you're like, well, what the hell? I already ruined it for the day. Absolutely. So well described. And by the way, one of the best named effects in all of psychology. So like, is this a way to counteract that having an emergency? Like what, like give us an example of, of how we can basically have an emergency reserve to counteract us falling down this spiral of, of the what the hell effect. Yeah. So you're, um, you're pointing to uh, some wonderful research by my colleague, Marissa Sharif on the importance of actually having really tough goals. Like I'm going to try to exercise seven days this week, or I'm going to try to meditate seven days this week. You want to push yourself because tough goals are best in terms of accomplishment. However, then they create the what the hell effect as a big problem. Because if you're trying for seven days a week, you miss one day, you say, what the hell? I'm never going to hit my goal. So she came up with this very clever idea that I think relates to ideas used by some dieting programs, for instance, of giving yourself some like cheat days, emergency reserves. She actually thinks it's important that they be referred to as emergency reserves rather than cheats because um, then you don't feel entitled to take them, but rather only allow yourself to recover when there is a true emergency. So she ran experiments showing that if you tell people, set the toughest goal, seven days a week, I'm going to aim to do this thing, but I'm going to give you two emergency reserves. And if you if you have a miss, we'll pull out that shit, we'll call it get out of jail free, and we'll say you're still on track. Um, if anybody uses Duolingo, you might have seen they have streak freezes. If you're like trying to build a streak of, of practicing um, the language, they'll let you have sort of this kind of emergency reserve where you freeze. It doesn't really count as a, a breakage. So you um, get out of jail free. And she tested this against something that's psychologically should be identical, which is let's set a wimpier goal. Instead of seven days a week, I'll try to do it five days a week. That's literally identical to seven days a week with two emergency reserves. But you see dramatically better outcomes when people are striving for that higher, tougher goal, but just giving themselves these emergency chits as opposed to a wimpier goal that isn't going to push you and stretch you as much. Um, so I, I think it's really interesting research, and, and we can think in our lives about where is it that we might want to push ourselves hard, but also have a way to recover when there is a misstep that doesn't lead us to throw up our hands and give up on ourselves. How can we give ourselves those emergency boundaries? Yeah. And I think related to flexibility, you've talked about this study that I'd love for you to share with us that is about like students picking their own deadlines, can you tell us about that and, and how that relates to flexibility? Do you remember that one? It was like students picking their own deadlines. I, I think you're thinking about research that was done by Dan Ariely um, and commitment devices where students, he, he let students in one of his classes self-set deadlines that would have penalties associated with them uh, as opposed to, you know, there's, there's alternative ways that you could have assignments due in a class. You could either say like, they'll all be due at the end of the semester or um, I'll as the professor, have you hand them in at, you know, the middle of the semester and the end of semester. So I could set your deadlines, you could set your deadlines, or we could just say everything's due at the end. So um, in this experiment, Dan Ariely, who's a uh, best-selling author and professor at Duke University, tested which of these is best for students and what do people do when they have the opportunity to self-set deadlines? Do they, do they set deadlines for themselves or do they just do what an economist would expect, which is say like, 
I'll put them all at the end of the semester and give myself maximal flexibility. So interestingly, what um, he found is that unlike what an economist would predict, a lot of students self-set deadlines that were earlier than the end of the semester. They didn't give themselves the maximum flexibility. And the reason for this, right, is that they recognize if they put all the deadlines stacked at the end, they're going to procrastinate on their work. It's all going to pile up and then they'll be left um, without enough time to do the work well. So there's this sophistication about the challenges they'll face if they're, they give themselves too much flexibility. And also, because he did an experiment, some people got to self-set the deadlines, some people didn't. He was able to test, does having the ability to constrain yourself and self-set those deadlines and give yourself flexible flexibility improve performance? And it does. So having the ability to self-set those constraints is better than having every, all the work pile up at the end of the term. Even though, of course, you could tell yourself in your mind, I'm going to try to spread it out. Having the ability to say at the beginning of the term, these are my deadlines and my professor will penalize me if I don't hit them. That's the that was better. Yeah. So it's still important to have like deadlines or have some sort of like negative thing that could happen if you don't do what you're supposed to do. But it's also important to make sure that you have some flexibility built into the whole process so that if you do mess up, it's just not over and downhill. From exactly. There. It's a it is a bit of a delicate balance, as you're pointing out. The deadlines, by the way, are an example of a commitment device where people are creating some constraint on themselves, recognizing that they could have a self-control challenge. But you're right. You also need um, you don't want to penalize yourself so much or be so extreme that there's nothing you can do when, when things go wrong. So we need both structure and recovery strategies. It's, and that's life. Maybe that actually wraps up behavior change in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this concept of emergency is sort of like a negative way to approach our habit building. We often hear about the power of positive thinking, but you, you talk about over-optimism and how we can blind ourselves and it could lead to overconfidence. And you say that anticipating and planning for obstacles can be more powerful than adopting a positive mindset. So in terms of everything that we're talking about, tell us about your perspective on the power of negative thinking. This is another one where I just want to say you also have to believe in yourself to get things done. So there, there is it is important to have positive beliefs to some extent. But if you don't plan for what can go wrong, if you aren't thinking negatively and anticipating obstacles, I mean, that's sort of the the whole benefit of um, all the research that's been done on behavioral science and strategies. Because if you say this might go wrong if I don't create constraints, for example, if I don't set goals that I break down into bite-sized pieces, if I don't seek out social support or come up with a commitment device, then you are un much less likely to succeed. So it is really important to set yourself up for success by doing that planning process, anticipating obstacles. And there's really wonderful work by um, NYU psychologist Gabrielle Ettingen on the importance of that kind of obstacle-based planning where you think, what could go wrong? What could get in my way as I'm trying to achieve this goal? And then you say, okay, and how am I going to overcome it? And that improves uh, results. And, and it's something we do, I think, naturally, right? Again, going back to engineering, it's something we do naturally when we take on certain types of work, but we don't always do it in our personal lives. We don't always do it when we're thinking about our productivity, and it's important to do it there, too. It's also been called a pre-mortem. We know what a post-mortem is, like something fails, and you go, oh, what went wrong? Like, let's analyze it. But it can be really useful to do the same thing before you pursue a goal and to sit down and say, imagine this all falls apart and goes wrong. What are the most obvious reasons this would go wrong? So that's a pre-mortem. And that's another way of thinking about planning for obstacles. And it totally makes sense because the more you plan, the more prepared you are. So that and that negative thinking is actually quite positive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? Um, okay, so let's talk about group behavior. The people who we surround ourselves with really matters as well. And the closer you are to someone, the more that their situation is going to end up resembling our own and you're going to be influenced by their behavior. So tell us, why is it human nature to always follow typical behavior? Oh, such a great question. So social norms, which is the sort of nerd term for what you're describing, our tendency to follow other people probably came about 
much like we were talking about, where's present bias come from? They probably evolved ages ago for us to work in communities together, right? So you look around, everybody else is taking this action. Everybody else is wearing this outfit. Everybody else is behaving in this way. And probably I should follow along and our community will function better as a result. And so that led us to look to others to figure out like what's appropriate behavior, what's the right behavior, what's a good decision. And there is information in what other people around you are doing. So it's not a crazy model, even if there weren't the cooperative instinct. So think about, and this is going to sound a little scary, but I often say to my students, like, imagine everybody in this auditorium who I'm teaching, like, but you jumps up and starts running for the door. What should you do objectively? And like, the answer is obvious. You should get up and run for the door too. There's some threat. So there is information in the crowd. Um, But there can also be, of course, weird things that the crowd is doing. They can mislead you, but often we are gaining knowledge from following others. And so it's an instinct that's deeply ingrained is to do what everyone else is doing. And so what's 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 bad about that? Like what can happen negatively to us if we aren't aware that this could be happening? Oh gosh, how long do you have? <laughs> like, I mean, if you think about the spreading of misinformation, conspiracy theories, um, if you think about bubbles in the stock market, because everybody herds and they all say like, oh, let's all buy the same ticker symbol or let's all get behind internet stocks or, you know, whatever. That, I'm talking about past years now too. Um, internet stocks are doing fine at the moment. Well, not great because anyway, as we're talking, the stock market is having some ups and downs. But um Generally, there are a lot of ways that if we just sort of blindly follow others, we can make mistakes. But there are also lots of ways that if we pay attention wisely to the behaviors of others, we can gain knowledge and information. And it is a trick. It's a bit of a tricky path to walk to think carefully about, is this a situation where I'm following others out of instinct and there's not real information and this is not wise and I should make my own judgments and analyze Or is this a situation where I'm learning because other people have sort of done the research before me and I can just piggyback and follow along? Yeah. So something else that was really interesting and and was quite surprising to me is that when someone is struggling, they can actually be helped if they're put in the position of a mentor. And you say that giving advice, even if it's something that you're struggling with or not very good at, can help you achieve what you're trying to do. So tell us about that. It's pretty interesting. This is one of my favorite findings of the last decade, really. And it's, um, it's research by... University, um, Northwestern University's um, Lauren Eskris Winkler. And she was doing her doctoral dissertation work, trying to understand what made people gritty, working with Angela Duckworth, who we've talked about a couple of times. And she started interviewing people who were struggling to succeed and was really intrigued to discover that even students who were getting C's, even salespeople who weren't hitting their numbers, even people who weren't achieving their their health goals actually had a lot of wisdom about what was going wrong and what might help them course correct. And they lacked confidence in many cases to actually implement those insights. And as she talked to them, she also discovered they loved being asked for this wisdom that they had accumulated about what might turn things around. But what they were used to hearing from people who came to talk to them was like, just, you know, other people's two cents. When someone's struggling, they're constantly being peppered with unsolicited advice about how to turn their life around. And rarely are they put on a pedestal and told, you know, maybe you actually have some things figured out yourself. So she thought, what if we sort of flip the script? What if these people who actually have a lot of insight because they've been trying so hard, even if it hasn't been working out, what if I put them on a pedestal and make them coach others? What would happen? And she thought a few benefits might ensue to the, the coach. She thought one thing is it's going to boost confidence because now I'm putting you in the position of advice giver. You're going to think, gosh, maybe I'm not such a schmo. Maybe I could achieve something. If there's someone else who's even sort of further behind me who I could help, I must have what it takes. Second, they're going to have to introspect more deeply about what insights they have that could be working for them. And and maybe they won't have thought about that very carefully before. Even though they were trying to achieve this goal, maybe they didn't put them their soul, whole heart and soul into figuring out the how that they need to now that they're accountable to someone else and have to give someone else coaching. And finally, once you coach someone else, you're going to feel like a hypocrite if you don't take your own advice. So that was sort of the magic formula. Those three things she thought might lead advice giving to help the advice giver. And she has now run lots and lots of experiments showing that 
it really works. When you are giving advice to other people, you actually get benefits yourself if it's a situation where just motivation and confidence are the barriers. We did this with high school students in one case where they coached their younger peers on how to study more effectively in school. And they literally didn't have social interaction. They just filled out an online survey where they answered questions and and were told, you know, your answers are going to go to a younger student. And that significantly improved their grades. I think it's a really powerful tool that we should be using more when we see someone struggling is instead of just putting our arm around them and offering them advice, which can be demotivating, thinking, how can I put this person on a pedestal? How can I get them coaching someone else so that they may have better outcomes themselves? I love this. I, I love this so much. How, how do you think we can use this in our personal lives? Like, let's say we have some sort of goal. What can we do ourselves to become advice givers? Yeah, I love this um, question because it's one I've thought about a lot. And I actually realized that I am using it sort of unintentionally or unwittingly in my own life in a way that I think lots of people could copy and paste um, to achieve my professional goals. So I have what I now refer to as an advice club, um, which is a group of women at a similar career stage with similar career goals who we all got together a number of years ago and said, like, we're struggling with some decisions about like, you know, should I do this? Should I do that? We have a lot of different asks that are made of us. And wouldn't it be helpful if we could ping each other for that sort of outsider perspective when we get stuck? So we did this. And I initially thought it was going to be really useful to have this group of women because it would, you know, form social bonds and I'd get their sort of expert consulting for free and I'd be happy to give mine in exchange. Uh, And those things have happened and they've been great. But what's been really interesting and surprising is actually every time they ping me about a challenge they're facing in their careers and how to handle it, I'm finding that I get huge benefits from thinking through their challenge, offering my perspective. Um, And the reason is, one, it's actually much easier from that arm's length distance to think through a problem, right? Like I'm not emotionally connected to it. The person who asked them, I don't have a relationship with that person, so I'm not walking through all all of those issues. In general, when we take an outsider perspective, we're much better at making judgments. So I can think of it from arm's length and I can come up with a good solution then I articulate that for them. It builds my confidence because I'm like, wait a minute, I can totally tackle these kinds of tough problems. I've got it figured out. And then because our careers are similar, our life circumstances are similar, I get a similar issue. I you know, ask a few months down the line, I've already thought it through, I've analyzed it, I've got my answer, I'm ready to go. And so it benefits me immensely to be in this position of the advice giver. Um, and so I think we can all form advice clubs when there's some goal that we have that we want to achieve that we know will face obstacles. It could be a challenge. Finding other people with similar aspirations who are likely to encounter similar obstacles, agreeing you want to form an advice club so there will be only you know, solicited advice given, not unsolicited advice. That's really important. And then you can benefit not only from the power of advice giving, but from social cohesion and from the information these other folks will bring to uh, bear. And I think it's sort of this magic solution we should all use more in life. And, and I think it's no accident that lots of organizations that are set up to help us achieve goals build things like this, right? If you think about sponsorship and Alcoholics Anonymous, or there are lots of entrepreneurs groups that create these kinds of mentoring um, cycles. So it's out there, it's being used, but I think we can all harness that insight and put it into our lives in, in more ways. I agree. I think this is an excellent hack. So let's talk about your research with covid Uh, 19 vaccine adoption. I thought this was pretty cool. So you are one of the leaders for Behavior Change for Good initiative at the Wharton School. And you guys did a lot of research around helping people take the COVID-19 vaccine. And I'd love to spend some time on this because I think a lot of these tactics can actually easily be adopted into business and marketing. And so I'd love to hear what were the most effective tactics to get people to take the vaccine and what were the tactics that didn't work? Yeah, great question. Well, so let me back up and say that um, we weren't necessarily trying to persuade the vaccine hesitant. That isn't my area of expertise, but most of my research is really around people who have something they're up for doing, they even think might be good for them, but maybe there's some barriers that could be obstacles that prevent them from achieving their own goals. And this is the case often where, um, you know, you have some intention actually about 78% of people who say they'll get a flu vaccine every year follow through. So lots of people who intend to get a vaccine or go to the gym or get a colonoscopy or save for retirement never actually nail it. So we were focused more on that group. I think that's important to point out um, because I think you'd need different solutions to hesitancy. But what we then did is we ran a tournament. So I have about 150 scientists in different disciplines who... um, 
are part of the Behavior Change for Good initiative that I co-direct with Angela Duckworth. And we said, let's go to all these brilliant minds and ask them, what do you think is the best communication strategy if we want to nudge people to get a vaccine either at an upcoming doctor's appointment or at a pharmacy? Uh, that where they've gotten a vaccine previously. Like, what what should we say to them? And they came up with dozens of ideas, actually, you know, almost 100 ideas. We sort of whittled it down to like, what's legal? What's feasible? How do we communicate with people? <laughs> and we tested dozens of messages and hundreds of thousands of Americans. And the first really boring but important finding is just sending reminders, reminder text messages. That alone, you know, go get a vaccine. It's available for free. Go do this. That alone helped significantly. So just simple reminders are more valuable than we appreciate. In fact, repeated reminders also more valuable than single reminders. We probably don't nag people enough. So that's my boring advice. But more interesting insight is that what rose to the top is sort of the best communication strategy among all sorts of things tested from humor, you know, let's drop a joke in there to make people laugh, to tell people everyone else is doing it because we know about social norms. Um, The best performer said, a vaccine is reserved for you or it's waiting for you. Uh, so that it feels like it already belongs to you. It's been it's been set aside. And so what's the psychology that's propelling that to be so powerful? Uh, well, research shows, first of all, that um, we value things that belong to us more than things that could belong to us or belong to other people. Um, it's called the endowment effect. Um, we don't want to lose that thing. Oh, it's mine. Like, don't no nobody else should have my vaccine. It's got my name on it. Um, it suggests there's an, a recommendation. Your healthcare provider, right, wouldn't reserve something from for you if they didn't think it was a really good idea that you get it. So, so it's conveying that recommendation, and probably also a sense that there may be, you know. Um, Scarcity, like not everybody has one reserved for them and may be a desirable thing, right? And maybe they're growing fast. So what I think is really cool is that this was robust across different settings, um, whether it was encouraging people to get in their car, drive to the pharmacy, or they're already coming in to see a a healthcare provider and they're just going to be invited to get a vaccine when they're there. Um, Do they take it? Telling them in advance that a vaccine has been reserved for them makes it more likely that they say, yeah, I'd like that when they're at their appointment. And there's been research done since by a team at UCLA showing that this kind of reserve for you language, it doesn't just promote vaccination, but it makes us more inclined to do everything from register for a conference where someone says, hey, a seat's been reserved for you to you know, download an audio book or a, a, a Kindle book a Nook book, whatever kind of online device you, or whatever kind of reading device you prefer. Um, if something is reserved for you or communicated as reserved for you, you value it more and you're more likely to follow All through. I see, and I'm a marketer, so I'm just like, I'm definitely using that for one of my next email subject lines. <laughs> it's like your XYZ is reserved for you or waiting for you. I feel like that will work so good. So we had Dr. Maya Shank- Shanker on the show and she talks about nudging. She was working for the Obama administration formally and she was head of their nudge unit it. So you've mentioned nudge uh, just a little bit ago. I think it's super interesting. How has nudging helped improve the world for better? I'm sure you know a bit about this. I'd, I'd like to understand what nudging is for anybody who doesn't know and how how has that changed the world for better? Yeah, this is a great question. I love that you had Maya on the show. She's a dear friend and collaborator. Um, so nudging is trying to encourage people to adopt a behavior that they would agree is in their best interest. So importantly, it's not like you know, sneakily trying to get people to buy cigarettes <laughs> or, you know, do something that, that that isn't in their best interest. But a, a nudge would be pushing people with the tools of psychology towards a decision that they already would favor if they had all the time and in the world to analyze their choices uh, and doing so in a way that doesn't create any change in their incentives. So you're not, you know, paying them to go, say, get a vaccine or, you um, you're not mandating that they get the vaccine. You're leaving them total freedom to choose and not changing their incentive structure. You're just using our understanding of how humans make decisions to set them up for a a choice that's in their long-term best interest. So I think a good example of this, probably the sort of best known example of a successful nudge and a big win for nudging um, is in the retirement savings domain where lots of people say their employer has a retirement savings program, they could put a little portion of every paycheck into it, it'd be matched by their employer, and they'll build up this security for retirement. But lots of people don't do that, even though they know they should or even mean to get around to it. You have to, you know, sign some paperwork, and lots of people just don't bother. So a sort of classic nudge win is showing that uh, if you default people, meaning they don't have to take any action, it's just set up for them, 
into saving for retirement when they join an employer. And they can, you make it easy to opt out. So they can say like, please don't do that. Please don't put a portion of my paycheck. I maybe just check a box on a form and I can opt out. You end up seeing some, you know, vastly like 30 percentage point increases in how many people enroll in these programs, as opposed to the standard way that this kind of program worked, which was you join a new employer and you can fill out some paperwork, check a box to enroll in it. So that would be the default is you're not enrolled, but you can take steps to opt in way less effective, way lower um, enrollment rates than it's the default that you're enrolled and you can take steps to opt out. And this is true for lots of things. It seems to matter for things like whether I'm an organ donor, am I defaulted in or do I have to just check a box inside my name to become one when I go to the DMV? Whatever the default is, that's a nudge. It's sort of nudging you towards it. You infer that it's recommended or else why would I have been defaulted into it? But you can easily get out of it. But it matters really quite a lot. And so thinking carefully about how do I use defaults wisely can um, can lead to better outcomes in a lot of settings. And that's just one example. There are lots of nudges. Saying something's reserved for you is a nudge, for instance. Yeah, I love nudging. I feel like it's it's so interesting. All right, so as we wrap this up, I always ask the same two questions at the end of the show. Then we do something kind of fun at the end of the year and like chop it up with all the different guests. So the first one is, what is one actionable thing my listeners can do today to become more young and profiting tomorrow? Ooh, I love that. Form an advice club. Form a group of people with whom you share ambitions and goals and say you're going to reach out to each other when you hit stumbling blocks and aren't sure of what to do. And um, having that advice club, you're going to benefit from in all sorts of ways, including giving the advice is going to make you wiser and more confident and more capable. And you'll also form friendships and learn from other people's wisdom. Yeah. And I have to say, I did this when I was coming up as a podcaster. And when I was growing my influence on LinkedIn, I found every podcaster who was making any noise on LinkedIn. I put them all in a WhatsApp group. I scheduled a monthly mastermind call. And it was great because to your point, I felt like I was smarter because I was telling them what I knew. It made me remember things more and learn things more and want to find out more. And then you learn from other people and you create this great network. So it's a great strategy. And uh, what is your secret? to profiting in life. And profiting doesn't have to mean financial. It can mean just profiting in your life. My secret is that I do things I love for a living. Uh, And that means that every day when I wake up, I find it fun to do the things that are on my calendar rather than a source of pain or something I have to get through. And I do everything I do better because I'm enjoying it. Uh, And that's generally, I think, a secret to life is finding ways to make what might feel like a chore, might feel like work into a source of pleasure so that you'll put your whole self into it. Yeah, I think that's a big lesson from today's show, you know, making sure that you have fun, even in the things that you don't necessarily want to do. And so Katie, where can our listeners go to learn more about you and everything that you do? Probably the best place is my website, which is just katiemilkman.com. And it's Katie with a Y like Katy Perry. Uh, You can find out about my book, how to change my podcast choiceology, all of my research, um, my newsletter, Milkman Delivers, all on that one site. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for this great conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to Young and Profiting Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please write us a review or comment on your favorite platform. Nothing makes us happier than reading your reviews. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family, and on social media. I always repost, reshare, and support those who support us. You can find me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name. It's Hala Taha. Big thanks to the Yap team. As always, this is Hala signing off. <laughs>